Yeah. Hi, so I'm Elizabeth Castagnon. I am the president of the Sociology Club. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just quick, thank you for coming to this event and thank you for supporting us in Social Justice Week. Uh, we hope we can see you at all the other events. You might have gotten a handout for the rest of the events for the week. And if you didn't, please grab one. Um, but I'm here to introduce uh, Mickey Huff. Um, he is the director of Project Censored and he actually um, works at the Di Diablo Valley College and he teaches, he's a chair of the um, chair in the Department of History, and he teaches history and social science there. Um, but yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. Please help me introduce him. <laughs> Welcome him on stage. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I would um, like to certainly thank Dr. Peter Phillips and the sociology department, the sociology club, all the people that worked on the social justice um, Social Justice Week program. So I'd like to give a big round of applause to all the students and everybody that made this together happen. This, this is a student-run affair, and this is the second year in a row. Last year was uh, a great time, and this year is off to a great start. So we have a fantastic program all week long with many different activist groups and community members. We also have some incredible speakers, including tonight's speaker, of course. Um, on uh, Wednesday, we have Davey D from Hard Knock Radio, KPFA. <laughs> where, by the way, Peter Phillips and I are in our fifth year on the Project Censored show. So we're on uh, Friday afternoons at 1, and we're on 32 stations from Maui to New York. So we are, we are still uncensoring the news weekly at Pacifica. On Friday, we also have Medea Benjamin. Uh, so she'll, she'll be here, and Medea is still doing great work. Um, we actually interviewed her, pre-recorded last week, so this Friday on our the Project Censored show, we'll have Arnie Gunderson, who's just back from Fukushima, and we'll also have Medea Benjamin. So if you want to tune in Friday, you'll get to hear a little bit about what Medea's been up to, and she'll talk more about that Friday. Um, Thursday afternoon, there's a Project Censored panel, and again, you all probably have these... Uh, schedules so check them out share them and uh, hopefully we'll see you all throughout throughout the week um, this evening's uh, speaker is a best-selling author um, he's certainly no no stranger to controversy and significant journalism uh, David Talbot he is author of the New York Times bestseller brothers hidden history of the Kennedy years and the acclaimed national bestseller season of the witch he is founder and former editor-in-chief of Salon. He was a senior editor at Mother Jones, editor for the San Francisco Examiner. And he has written for The New Yorker, The Rolling Stone, The Guardian. He is author most recently of The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, The CIA, and The Rise of America's Secret Government. It's a fantastic book. It is chock full of untold histories to riff on Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick's uh, book. Uh, this one is full of it. Um, really information, actually full of uh, truthful information that the history books have oft overlooked or skipped over. And in fact, the corporate news media has uh, done due diligence to ignore uh, Talbot's work uh, in various stages over the years, but this book was not, uh, has not generated a lot of attention in the, in the corporate news media in terms of reviews. Um, and this is, there's a long history to that, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but before David Talbot comes up, I was going to frame a little bit here of you know, the subtitle of his work, The Rise of America's Secret Government. Um, you know, you may ha you've have heard the term se secret government before, whether it was back with Bill Moyers or others in 1987, uh, or uh, more recently with uh, congressional staffer Mike Lofgren, um, where the term deep state is now coming up, uh, bubbling from the surface. I think Peter Dale Scott is arguably one of the most significant scholars of deep, deep state issues. Um, and that means you know, sort of like the sub-government, the government behind the government, people that are actually pulling the strings, calling the shots that are not necessarily elected officials. Um, and, 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 and anytime you have people trying to talk about that system, right, whether it's CIA, NSA, you know, deep state operators controlling the media through Operation Mockingbird, uh, controlling all types of other events, false flag events, Gladio events, um, the first thing that comes out of the establishment's mouth is that you're a conspiracy theorist or you're crazy. 
Um, and that goes back to the 1960s when the CIA had an internal memo. Uh, this was after the Kennedy assassination. And uh, the CIA was trying to keep quiet critics of the Warren Commission, which, you know, of course, was completely uh, erroneous, full of holes. It was a cover-up story. Um, and what, what the CIA was trying to do was discredit people before they had a chance to get out of the gate. And this memo, you can look it up. I urge you to check it out. Lance DeHaven Smith has a book, Conspiracy Theory in America, part of Mark Crispin Miller series, um, where he talks about this. It's memo 1035-960. Um, I urge you to look it up, 1035-960. And what it suggests is that any time that um, whether it's at the time, you know, whether it's Epstein or Mark Lane or other critics, Mark, uh, including Peter Dale Scott, uh, of the Warren Commission report, they kind of start publishing these books, serious scholarly books. Um, the idea was, of course, to try to get the corporate news media to ignore these books. That's the best thing. Can we? Let's just pretend that they didn't happen, right? If the book gets published, right, and no one, uh, no one's there to read it, does, does it make any big splash or sound in in the public? Well, but what happens if if it starts to get a little more? Uh, steam behind it. What happens if it starts to you know, make some ripples? Well, then the CIA memo suggested that if ignoring these works doesn't, doesn't work out for the best, then you need to attack the people's character, the ad hominem. You need to say that they're crazy. And this is the terminology that the CIA wheeled out uh, in fact, Mark Crispin Miller at NYU, in fact, uh, researched this pretty significantly in terms of uh, LexisNexis uh, database and looked for uses of the term conspiracy theorist. And there's this spike in the term coming out of the 60s, and it's been in vogue ever since. Uh, still in vogue now after 9-11, election fraud. It gets tr trotted out uh, quite tirelessly. Um, but at any rate, this term, conspiracy theorist, this is actually the terminology that's used by the, the, the Central Intelligence Agency. So when you hear people in the public echoing and parroting that kind of terminology, they're basically doing the work of the deep state to discredit critics of their operations. And uh, I can think of uh, not, not many people in our contemporary framework that's you know really striking a chord with people in the deep state, uh, and I can quite imagine that there are a number of people in the deep state that were not pleased to see David Talbot's The Devil's Chessboard, um, because it really goes back and looks at the history of Alan Dulles. It looks at the history after uh, World War II and the machinations of all of these kinds of things, and they're very, very, very troubling. And I, I like the way that David starts, uh, he, he has some, there are anecdotes in the book, and he, he also talks about, well, in order to sort of be able to uh, deal uh, with the darkness, we also have to balance it with lightness, right? Maybe he can, he can riff on a, a little bit of that. But I want you to um, keep some of this stuff in your mind while he's speaking, and also to bear in mind a, a really interesting quotation from the director of the CIA in 1981, William Casey, who said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. And in the days of uh, Donald Trump uh, and sort of corporate circus, bread and circus media, where you know Trump was just at Worldwide Wrestling, WrestleMania 23, and then he's on the stage with, you know, uh, the uh, Republican uh, candidates. Again, the the lines are now completely gone between infotainment and our political spectacle, right? And so we need to really think critically and deeply about these many issues. And tonight's speaker is here to help us do that uh, e even more. And I would like to give a really warm welcome to a fantastic author and critic of American uh, political culture. Please welcome David Talbot. Good evening, everybody. And, uh, Thank you, Mickey. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, big fans of your show, and I was delighted to be on your show, as always. Um, you know, as Mickey was alluding to, the space for truth and for um, deep research uh, within the American media is shrinking uh, all the time. So it's so precious when we have a program like Project Censored, uh, and the work that Mickey and Peter uh, do is really essential. Um, 
I want to also uh, thank the sociology department and the sociology club. I, too, am a sociology graduate of UC Santa Cruz, class of 73, go banana slugs. Um, <laughs> it was the only school that would let me in because I was kicked out of high school. So um, I have a fond place in my heart for Santa Cruz always. Uh, well, today, uh, and I'm very delighted to be speaking on this occasion. Uh, obviously, uh, all of you young and very dedicated people, and some of us older ones as well, are dedicated to the idea of not just having a week dedicated to social justice, but an entire year. And uh, today, uh, I have some prepared remarks, but I'm just going to go off road a little bit to begin with. Today, I actually, very up close and personal, got to witness America's social justice system, so-called, at work, uh, down in Red, uh, Redwood City, in a courtroom down there. Uh, I have a young friend, a very close friend of my family, 21-year-old African-American, uh, who was caught up in the jaws of that system uh, for the first time. And uh, to see him come in in his orange uh, jumpsuit with 70 other people who were assigned to, uh, between them, public defenders who had just seen these people for the first time that very moment, while a uh, coldly efficient uh, judge basically railroaded these young and older people through her system was just appalling. And I know we've all seen this in our own lives, or you've seen it on TV sometimes or in films, but when you have a loved one who is caught up that way and you just see what's done to them, uh, and they're sort of the stamp that the system puts on them and the kind of um, contempt for these human beings that the system has, you see how justice is meted out to people who don't have the money to have a high-priced lawyer. That's what it comes down to. It's all about money. If you have uh, money, you can afford justice. If you don't, you can't. So I'm kind of pissed off right now. <laughs> and with that kind of uh, rage, I'd like to uh, deliver my prepared talk. <laughs> so we live in a lawless age. And I'm not speaking here of crime in the streets, as I was talking about earlier, but crime in the suites. <laughs> Top Washington officials from the president on down order remote controlled assassinations with the barest fig leaf of legal review. Are these human targets guilty or innocent? We'll never know. These decisions to spare or take human life, including the lives sometimes of American citizens, are conducted in star chamber-like secrecy. Since 9-11, our leaders have been playing God, ordering assassinations at will, torture, mind control experimentation, massive snooping on private citizens and foreign officials all over the globe, suspending our civil liberties, and expanding the war on terror wherever and whenever our all-powerful national security state decides it must intrude. Meanwhile, as Washington extends its ominous shadow into every corner of the world and every corner of our lives, Wall Street continues to amass wealth and impoverish the rest of the nation in a frenzy of looting with virtually no government oversight. Since, as Senator Bernie Sanders has repeatedly pointed out, Wall Street owns Washington. Recently, a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Afghanistan was subjected to withering U.S.-led bombardment for nearly an hour. Despite the frantic pleas that the medical staff at the hospital communicated to their American military contacts throughout this terrible ordeal. This fiery assault, which took the lives of doctors, nurses, and patients, was clearly intentional, as Doctors Without Borders later charged. The hospital's crime? treating wounded Taliban fighters, as required under international law. Doctors Without Borders called the hospital bombing a war crime, which it certainly was, and demanded an independent investigation. But in a pattern, in a pattern that is all too familiar, the Pentagon simply expressed its regrets, promised to conduct its own internal inquiry, and there the matter will certainly languish until a a bland official statement is released sometime in the future informing us that a mid-level military fall guy has been reprimanded and the case closed. When it comes to the top lawbreakers in our country, there is no law. 
There is no public accountability. No truth, no consequences. And when those at the top escape justice, when there is no rule of law, there can be no social justice. Nobody has been prosecuted, nobody has been prosecuted for the torture and murder of prisoners at so-called CIA black sites during the Bush-Cheney administration. In fact, the only CIA officer who went to prison, the hero, John Kiaraku, was punished for blowing the whistle on waterboarding. President Obama came into office criticizing the excesses of Bush's war on terror. But no sooner did he move into the Oval Office did he tell the American people that we must look forward, not back. And so with no public reckoning for the Bush era, the Obama administration was free to commit its own violations of international law and human rights, vastly expanding the government's drone killing program its Orwellian surveillance system, and its war on whistleblowers like Ed Snowden, a young man whose inspiring heroism is one of the few bright lights of our dark age. It's the age of terror, a word, as Glenn Greenwald points out, that means nothing and yet excuses everything, including our government's own widespread terror, which dwarfs that of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And of course, while Washington engages in criminal, criminal mayhem all over the world, not one of the Wall Street banksters responsible for the great crash of 2008, from which our economy has yet to fully recover, has seen the inside of a courtroom, like the young kids I saw today, let alone a jail. And the tax and credit and labor policies that the criminal masterminds of Wall Street advocate and implement through their hired servants in Washington, continue to shift wealth to the upper percentile of America. As this rampant violence and corruption at the top levels of our nation goes unpunished year after year, a deep rot begins to eat away at our, nation, our national psyche. President Obama harshly scolds Donald Trump for his reckless and morally unhinged public remarks about scapegoating Muslims, taking the leash off torturers, and killing civilians. But it's the endless and illegal war on terror, half of which has been presided over by Obama himself, that has paved the way for Trump's lunatic militarism, authoritarianism, and anti-Muslim fear-mongering. In our age of lawlessness, when no high official is held accountable, then anything is possible. Trump is just the product of America's unbridled id, a creature who has crawled from our moral swamp. And so, as we celebrate social justice this week on the Sonoma State campus, what must we ask of our fellow citizens if we are to arrest our nation's moral decline? First, we must urge Americans to know their history. We Americans, as most of us know here, suffer from amnesia when it comes to our national past. All that most of us know about our history comes from heavily censored school textbooks and the patriotic propaganda spewed out by cable TV news and by Hollywood. Films and TV shows like American Sniper, Zero Dark Thirty, Homeland, and so on and so on. Spectacles of spin that would make Joseph Goebbels proud. This constant barrage of American triumphalism not only manufactures consent, to use Noam Chomsky's phrase, it manufactures ignorance, a dumbing down of the American citizenry that ironically seems to be only getting worse in the digital age, which was supposed to liberate all of our minds. We all must learn about how oligarchy came to defeat and replace democracy in America as Bernie Sanders has sometimes alluded to on the campaign trail. But we need to go much deeper than Bernie's sound bites, as important and provocative as they are. As I write in my new book, The Devil's Chessboard, many of the darkest deeds of what some call our deep state or secret government began not simply after 9-11, 
but decades ago during the Cold War. At the center of this subversion of American democracy was a group of powerful Wall Street and na national security figures like the Dulles Brothers, men, and they were almost exclusively men, whom the brilliant sociologist C. Wright Mills called, quote, the power elite. Men like Alan Dulles, who shuttled between Wall Street and the shadowy intelligence world in Washington his whole career. They believed that democracy was too important to be left in the hands of people like you and me or our elected representatives. During Dulles's one foray into the democratic arena when he ran for Congress from the Upper East Side of Manhattan in 1938, he actually told the press that, quote, democracy only works if the so-called intelligent people run it. For some reason, the electorate didn't send him to Congress. <laughs> of course, the intelligent people that Dulles had in mind were himself, his brother, and law partner, John Foster Dulles, who would rise to become Secretary of State and give his name to Washington's International Airport, and the Dulles brothers' circle of wealthy and powerful business clients and political collaborators. You know, we Americans like to think of ourselves as a classless and democratic society, but of course we're not. We're as dynastic and oligarchic as the Game of Thrones. <laughs> and our kings and lords are just as brutal when it comes to grabbing power or maintaining their power. During his long reign at the center of America's secret government, those men who continue to wield power in one presidency after the next, no matter who happens to occupy the White House, and often in defiance of the president, Alan Dulles committed every sort of crime to enforce American interests around the world. And of course, by American interests, he really meant the interest of his corporate clients. As the force behind the creation of the CIA and as the agency's longest serving director, Dulles overthrew democratic governments around the world. He assassinated foreign leaders. He tortured people. He created a massive mind control program codenamed MKUltra. He opened private citizens' mail. He tapped their phones. In other words, Dick Cheney was only following in the giant steps of men like Alan Dulles. Today, the lobby of the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, is still graced by a bas-relief sculpture of Dulles, a man who looked more like a genial pipe-smoking British headmaster than the cold-blooded ex executioner, although that is precisely what he was. His monument is around us, reads the inscription beneath the sculpture. The words sound like a curse on the men and women who work at the CIA, our citadel of national security, and on all those, including us, whom they serve. When men like Alan Dulles are given license, or take the liberty of doing whatever they want to enforce America's imperial will around the world, it is of course only a matter of time before they are emboldened to do the same thing here at home. President Harry Truman, who signed the CIA into existence back in 1947, later came to realize that he had indeed created a monster. One that was capable not only of sabotaging democracies overseas and killing elected leaders, overseas, but also at home. Truman wrote a remarkable op-ed article for the Washington Post in December 1963, just weeks after the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas. To some observers during those emo emotionally fraught days after JFK's murder, the timing of Truman's bombshell of an essay, which attacked the CIA as a growing threat to democracy at home and abroad, was deeply disturbing. Was Truman suggesting that the CIA was in some way involved with the killing of President Kennedy, who had clashed bitterly with Alan Dulles throughout his administration over JFK's efforts to reduce Cold War tensions with Russia and Cuba? I will let those of you who are tempted to read my new book come to your own conclusions about Dulles and Kennedy's fate. As power generally does in cases of national traumas like the Kennedy assassination, the so-called intelligent men like Dulles move swiftly, swiftly to cover up the crime rather than to investigate it. Dulles, Kennedy's bitter enemy, got himself conveniently appointed to the Warren Commission, the distinguished group of power players assigned to solve the crime. The panel, under Dulles's firm direction, soon came to its foreordained conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald, the young high school dropout and mediocre marksman, 
and self-described patsy, had pulled off the rifle shot and the crime of the century. And since Oswald himself had already been promptly eliminated to spare the nation the trouble of a real trial, he was not there to dispute the Warren Commission's neat conclusion. Case closed. Go back to sleep, America. But Americans, to their credit, were restless and troubled in their sleep. Poll after poll over the last half century has demonstrated that most of us don't buy the official story of the Kennedy assassination. For many people in my generation, this was the beginning of questioning authority, which is to say the stirrings of a democratic consciousness. Today, all of us must continue to encourage to push for this growing skepticism about power, particularly when it comes to official lives, lies and the cover-up of crimes. And if our leaders refuse to hold those in Washington and Wall Street responsible for their lawbreaking, then we must begin to do it. Next month, my new publishing imprint, which is called Hot Books, will publish a provocative new book called American Nuremberg. The subtitle is The U.S. Officials Who Should Stand Trial for Post-9-11 War Crimes. Thank you. It's by a very good author, Rebecca Gordon, who was a human rights activist in Central America during the Reagan Wars there, and is now a philosophy professor at the University of San Francisco. As Gordon acknowledges in her book, given the current political realities, we cannot expect Congress or the courts to hold the men responsible for the vast criminality of the war on terror, from Presidents Bush and Obama on down. So, inspired by such examples as the Independent War Crimes Tribunal that was organized by the philosophers Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre during the Vietnam War, a similarly distinguished group of legal scholars and human rights experts uh, must come together to hold a trial for Bush, Obama, Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, CIA directors George Tenet, Michael Hayden, and John Brennan, military commanders, commanders David Petraeus and Stanley McChrystal, and the top government lawyers and psychologists and other functionaries who are primarily responsible for the war crimes of the past 15 years. Gordon writes, quote, there is a pressing need to bring the United States into the legal community of nations where it must be held accountable for its actions. If the most powerful country in the world, she writes, can violate international law and human rights with complete impunity, then why should any other nation be constrained? For the sake of the victims of the war on terror, for the sake of our own national soul, but even more for the future of humanity, we need a full accounting and real accountability for American war criminals. We need an American Nuremberg, end quote. And so let us begin this week that's dedicated to social justice by beginning to examine how we ourselves can restore the rule of law in our own country by holding those high officials responsible for crimes committed in our name. Justice is never perfect not even at Nuremberg in post-war Germany, which still stands as a shining symbol of international law. Thanks to men like Alan Dulles, many high-ranking Nazis were actually allowed to escape justice. And of course, the Allies did not hold themselves accountable for their own war crimes. The firebombing of Tokyo and Dresden, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But nonetheless, here today, we can begin to take the first steps in defiance of the official lawlessness of our own age, of this age of terror. We can start the slow wheels of justice by identifying the lawbreakers and their crimes, and we can make clear that these crimes are not being committed in our names. Not in our names. That must become our slogan. We are not good Germans. Someday, even if all of us are not there to witness it, Justice will prevail. Thank you very much. You going to take questions? Yeah. 
like to thank David Talbot for those thoughtful remarks and let you all know that we are going to have a conversation or a question and answer or comment period and uh, David is happy to talk with you all. We only have one microphone so that means that when you want to stand up and have your question uh, or your brief remarks, um, please try to say them or pr project them somewhat loudly so that the, the sound carries up here. And um, I think, do you want to rephrase? Sure. Yeah, D David will rephrase, not rephrase your question, but say it into the mic so that other people can hear it and it will also be picked up uh, on the cameras. So thanks for your cooperation. First question, I hear. Great. Okay, so the gentleman asked me about two books, uh, which are good books. Uh, one is particularly good, I think, James Douglas' book, uh, JFK uh, and the Unspeakable, uh, and the other, Stephen Kinzer's uh, joint biography of the two Dulles brothers, uh, uh, Alan and John Foster. Um, so here's what I think. I think James Douglas, uh, his book was very important. Uh, Jim is a Catholic activist. He's a very religious man, very spiritual man. Uh, he brought uh, that kind of perspective to this. He saw this as a, a wound in our American psyche that needs to be healed before we can move on as a country. Um, and the book I know, uh, as well as my earlier book, Brothers, had a big impact on some of the Kennedy family. Bobby Kennedy Jr., I know, took the book when he went to Dallas uh, not long ago, uh, I think for the first time, to, to look at Dealey Plaza, where his uncle had been killed. And um, it changed Bobby's thinking, it changed uh, Theodore, uh, Theodore Sorensen's thinking, and a number of people. Robert McNamara called me up, the former defense secretary, of course had his, his own war crimes to speak for uh, because of Vietnam. And he thanked me for my book, Brothers. So uh, there was a sense for, I think, a lot of that generation, particularly people or even people who worked with the Kennedys, that this was the kind of truth telling that we finally needed. And it took 40 years or more before, you know, I think the books, the best books started to come out on this subject. But, you know, each, I think, group of writers has been building on the next. And I think we're getting closer and closer to the full truth about Dallas and in large part because of the great work done by people like James Douglas. So I hardly recommend that book. Stephen Kinzer, not so much, I have to say. Kinzer is a former New York Times reporter. He was a good war correspondent, foreign correspondent. He's done some good books on uh, the coup, the CIA coup in Guatemala and in Iran. Uh, and I think his reporting on those areas is particularly good. But you know, if you're trained as a New York Times reporter, a journalist like he is, it's, it's so deeply inbred, the taboos of our, meet, of our journalism system, that he wouldn't go all the way in certain areas. And he certainly, uh, not the book I read, that he, he certainly didn't tackle the Kennedy assassination. He certainly didn't put it on Dulles' doorstep, as I do in uh, The Devil's Chessboard. So to answer your final question, do I think the CIA was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy? Yes and no. Not the CIA as it's formally organized, and it wasn't, I think, uh, directed or ordered by John McCone, who was the CIA director at the time, who had replaced Alan Dulles after JFK fired him. But certainly uh, elements of the CIA organized the assassination, and these weren't just rogue people. It was the old boy network within the CIA, which is essentially the uh, core of the CIA. Um, these were people who were still loyal to Alan Dulles, uh, people like uh, Howard Hunt, like uh, William Harvey, who I think is a very important figure, David Morales, uh, and others. Um, William Harvey, as I go into in the book, was the head of the CIA assassination operation, uh, a job that uh, Dulles himself gave to him in 1960, I believe. Um, and he had uh, blood all over his hands. I mean, he was involved probably in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the nationalist leader in the Congo. Uh, he had very close ties to the underworld, the mafia. Uh, when he went to Rome, where the uh, CIA sent him 
in the final year of the Kennedy administration because the Kennedys were so furious at William Harvey, he was about to be fired. And so to save his career, the CIA sent him to Rome where he became head of the, the station, the CIA station. He immediately asked his deputy there to begin to look for mafia assassins to kill uh, left-wing leaders, Italian uh, Communist Party officials. Uh, his deputy couldn't believe it and, and you know, balked at the order, but um, that was, and, and, and his deputy, a really a good guy named Mark Wyatt, later went on to tell his children, his grown children, that Bill Harvey, based on things he knew, was indeed involved in the murder of uh, JFK. In fact, he saw Harvey, the head assassin for the CIA, on a plane, uh, he was supposed to be in Rome at the time, but he was on a plane to Dallas in early November 1963. And when he asked him, what are you doing? Where are you, why are you going there? He said, oh, I'm, you know, something vague, like I'm there just to look, look over things. Uh, he was probably going to look over things. I think he was going to look at the operation. So uh, none of these guys would have acted on their own. They would have only done so with the uh, green light, with the approval of the old man, as he was known, Alan Dulles. He was a revered figure within the CIA culture, and not only within the CIA culture. This was a man who had an unusual network of power that stretched from Wall Street to the national security circles to the oil industry. Many of his major clients uh, and his brother uh, at their law firm, Sullivan Cromwell, were Texas oil industry clients. So, uh, and he was very well connected to the US military and the Pentagon. There were few figures today, probably no figure today, who is exactly comparable to an Alan Dulles. He's like Dick Cheney on steroids. So, um, you know, as you look at sort of the chain of command, people who are in power in America, who had the capacity and the gravitas and the stature within that world to, um, to set something like this in motion, it certainly, I think, begins and ends with an Alan Dulles. Very uh, important question. So the gentleman uh, is a veteran of World War II, and he has gone to Vietnam and uh, had occasion to see some of the terrible uh, deformities that children are being born there. I suspect because of Agent Orange. It's that uh, Agent, Orange. Agent Orange, which of course was the herbicide that was sprayed randomly all over uh, uh, Vietnam to destroy the foliage so we could have better targets. Pardon me? Created by Monsanto. Uh, Dow Chemical. Yes. Um, Let's combine it with uh, like a phosphate roundup. And sure. Spray it around here. And so, I mean, to me, what this uh, suggests is again, yes, these were war crimes that were committed against the people of Vietnam that continue to have it, these terrible effects uh, that never were punished, that the people responsible for this at Dow Chemical or the Pentagon were never brought to justice. And uh, in fact, of course, every war has these terrible environmental and health. Uh, problems, disasters that continue to ripple uh, decade after decade. Right now, we're creating a new Agent Orange um, calamity in Iraq and Afghanistan through the operation of these open air burn pits. Do people know about the burn pits? The burn pits are these huge waste dumps that were built by, guess who? Dick Cheney's company, Halliburton KBR, uh, made a fortune off them. Um, and they burn everything in them, at every military base in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, plastics, uh, metals, uh, medical waste, uh, old munitions, human body parts. And our soldiers are forced to breathe this junk 24-7. Um, so in some cases, the air is so polluted that the, the soldiers desperately, uh, in their barracks, put towels up against the ventilation so the air can't come in. And in the morning, uh, they told uh, this uh, one journalist who has written a book for me, a uh, military whistleblower, former Marine and, and Army veteran named uh, Joe Hickman, that these white towels were black by the morning time when they woke up. Um, among the victims, we believe, of the burn pits was Bo Biden, Joe Biden's son who served at two of the worst bases where the worst pollution was, uh, inc including Balad in Iraq. And he came back home, of course, with a rare brain cancer. There's clusters of rare brain cancers, of terrible respiratory disease. Thousands of soldiers are coming home with this, as well as the people of Iraq and Afghanistan who live downwind from uh, the, this terrible pollution. 
So again, every war has these hidden costs that the American people are not told about. And the people who bear the brunt of those co costs, of course, are our own soldiers, who we always say we honor their service as, but until they come home and we throw them away like waste and we don't take care of them. And the people, of course, that we devastate in these countries where we go to war. Yes, wow. so an, again, war crimes. And he, he's mentioning the napalm and the white phosphorus that was dropped in Vietnam on the population there. And of course, there's a famous photo we all remember of the young girl running down the uh, trail. Well, she was lucky. And her, her, her clothes had been burned off. Her skin was, of course, terribly burned. Uh, the gentleman well, you're right. So the gentleman asked about the, the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower, of course, termed it, uh, just as he was conveniently leaving the White House, having helped build the military industrial complex to enormous proportions. So I don't think of uh, old Ike as a hero when it comes to that. Uh, he sort of turned it over to poor young Jack Kennedy, said, here you go, I built this monster, now you deal with it. Um, but yes, that military industrial complex now I think has gotten so big, in fact our whole, con our whole economy is militarized. It's not just a complex anymore. Virtually every sector I think of the American economy is touched in some way by this enormous war budget or, and surveillance budget that we've created, particularly after 9-11. I mean, the number of people who have, uh, you know, security clearances now, the number of agencies, private companies and corporations that we don't even know about. I mean, in the old days, we could say, oh, well, it's the CIA that's in charge of snooping on people. Now it's the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon has its own uh, operations, the State Department, uh, and then there's the, the multitude of private corporations, private contractors with whom Washington uh, does business that we've never even heard of. Um, so, you know, the entire nation has been militarized at this point. Sometimes out here in bucolic, you know, California and the Bay Area, it's easy to lose track of that. Although, you know, Silicon Valley has also been uh, recruited into this war effort and uh, it plays an important role. And of course, the defense secretary, who is now Ashton Carter, routinely comes out here to pep up, you know, the Silicon Valley CEOs, telling them how much we need them. And of course, there's now this huge battle over encryption involving Apple. Um, and, you know, the Silicon Valley does have a conscience, or at least some people in Silicon Valley have a conscience when it comes to working for the war state, the, the surveillance state. And certainly when Ed Snowden stood up to that surveillance state, this young, brilliant engineer who had a brilliant career uh, ahead of him uh, and threw it all away at the age of, what, 28 when he did this initially? Uh, that is a kind of remarkable heroism that you don't normally see no matter what generation. And it only comes along once in a while. And his greatest fear, of course, when he did this, he told uh, the filmmaker Laura Poitras, uh, was that it would be met with a big collective yawn that wouldn't make any difference. He would destroy his life for nothing. Fortunately, it did have an impact, as we all know. It made the country, at least for a while, begin to uh, re reflect on what has been done in our name. And do we want to be living 15 years after 9-11 uh, with this big brother state, uh, this police state, essentially, where many of our liberties have been suspended um, and where every, virtually every part of our life can be inspected uh, by the government? So, you know, Ed Snowden is now hunkered down in Moscow. He's in exile. Julian Assange, another brave whistleblower, is, un is in house arrest, under house arrest in uh, the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Chelsea Manning, another brave person who said, and this always chokes me up when I read this quote to this day, this young, uh, you know, soldier, uh, Bradley at the time, now Chelsea, who saw these hideous videos of uh, what we were doing to people on the ground in Iraq, these helicopter gunships blowing these innocent people apart. And he said, I, I just couldn't keep these things in my head anymore. And that's what it takes for a conscience to work. That's what it takes for a soldier, and there are soldiers sometimes who say to their superior <laughs> officers, no. And they're, by law, they are required to say no if it, when, it, when they're ordered to commit a war crime. And Chelsea Manning did say that. No, I can't live with this. I can't have this in my head. I'm going to tell the world. And as a result, now, of course, he's, uh, she's locked away in federal penitentiary for years. But uh, I bet she doesn't have those images or that guilt uh, locked in her head anymore. Right here. 
No, I think that's important. Uh, you know, where the, the old saying, um, think globally, act locally. Exactly. And, uh, and sometimes, frankly, working at the national level seems so daunting and so imposing and so impossible, given how rigged the system is. Look at, poor, look at poor Bernie now with the super delicates and all that. I mean, you know, it's all the, this energy, the youthful energy that's going into that campaign, and those young people are seeing how American politics really works. But I do still believe, and some people think I'm a little naive for thinking this, but democracy can be made to work at the local and state level to some extent, if you're well organized. And um, in San Francisco, I'm testing my thesis right now. We're testing it here. Yes, good for you. Uh, and I've, I've begun to test it by joining, helping start a group called SF Vision that's fighting against the takeover of the city by the 1%, the tech elite, that is forcing people out of their homes. The evictions are skyrocketing. The homeless problem, as you know, if you've gone down to San Francisco recently, is, is a national disgrace. And Ed Lee, this mayor who sits in City Hall has completely sold out the city to uh, Twitter and Airbnb and all the other uh, tech companies that have, you know, taken root in San Francisco. Um, you know, he decided to just let thousands of new tech employees, high paid tech employees, come into the city through tax incentives and all that without having any housing for them. So guess what? The landlords who uh, had, you know, people didn't make quite as much already in these homes thought, oh, I can make three or four times as much if I throw these clowns out. So thousands of people are being evicted now. I just heard of a woman in my neighborhood who had been trying for years to get pregnant with her husband, did get pregnant, got an eviction notice, and miscarried a few days later. I mean, so it just, the, the human uh, tragedy of this, you know, is, is palpable right now in cities like San Francisco, where the wealth gap has exploded. At what point do Americans just say enough to that? Uh, you know, enough to the war state, as we were talking about earlier, but also enough to this obscene wealth gap. Bernie Sanders, no matter what happens to his campaign, owes a, is owed a huge debt of gratitude by the American people for playing the role of rabbi and, and you, know, uh, you know, the crusader and champion for the people. Um, and, you know, again, reminding us of how out of whack our uh, country has become. And, you know, we all have to just now get organized. So I'm a writer. I didn't want to leave my room, my comfortable room, you know, and get into the streets again at my age. I used to do it a lot, you know, I was younger when I was your guys' age. But I did. At 64, I decided, well, you know, for my kids, if my kids want to live in San Francisco, if they have any chance, as the young filmmakers and creative people they are, of staying in the city where they were raised, then I have to get out there and fight. And that's what we're doing, I'm sure, a lot of you are as well. Speaking of Social Justice Week. Okay, another one. So we are engaging in a number of races, local races. We helped get Aaron Peskin elected in the North Beach uh, and Chinatown District, uh, District 3, last November. It was a very important race. They threw, they being the sort of Donald Trump of San Francisco, this bloated plutocrat, this tech investor named Ron Conway. Uh, he's the money behind uh, the throne at City Hall. He threw everything he could into the race against Aaron Peskin, who he knew would be a problem. He's a very progressive guy. He's terrific. It was a hard-fought campaign, but despite being outspent, Aaron won. And that one extra person on the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco has made a world of difference because we now have a one uh, vote majority, a progressive majority. And in terms of, you know, fighting evictions and fighting against some of the, uh, you know, these big tech companies, uh, it's made a huge difference. Now, unfortunately, we have five other races that we have to focus on in November. So it's a district by district battle. It's a guerrilla war to take back our own city. And we've sort of picked the people that we're going to throw our support to. We're out there, you know, campaigning with them. We just threw a big party at a bar in the hate for another uh, candidate uh, from the hate and the Fillmore, a guy named Dean Preston, who's a, he's a tenants' rights lawyer who's been fighting his whole life in Sacramento and San Francisco for renters who've been, you know, thrown out of their homes. So, um, you know, I'm determined to do everything I can. And, you know, because as Bobby Kennedy said at the end of his life, when he was interviewed by a PBS station. He was in the middle of his uh, presidential race, like Bernie right now. Uh, you know, he was tired, he was, 
he never, I think, got over emotionally the death of his brother. He looked 15 years older than he really was. His face was sunburned and kind of ravaged. I mean, people clawed at him and scratched him because of all these crowds because they were so desperate to be saved by another Kennedy. You know, we were in the middle of this terrible war in Vietnam that kept dragging on and on. The cities were on fire. The, you know, uh, the racial tensions were terrible. And so this, all the hopes of people were being invested in this one poor guy, you know. And so he was interviewed, and I always remember this, I saw a, a film of it later, and the guy said, so why do you keep doing this, what you do? Your brother's been killed, you know, you have so many reasons to give up. And he said, he looked, he waited, he paused a moment, he said, well, what other choice do we have, you know? And that's, I guess, the way I feel at this point. I know I've been kind of negative today, maybe it's because I've been so angry down the courtroom seeing how people get processed in America if they don't have money. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, what choice do we have? We have to fight back. Right here. So, okay, th this is a very important question, and, and the woman is asking about election fraud and how widespread it is today, and she thinks that the Clinton operation has been guilty of it against Bernie. And even more terrifying, she's uh, based on a comment she heard the writer Greg Pallas make recently, who's done a lot of great investigative work on election fraud. Uh, he thinks that the fix is in for Trump in November, which is truly terrifying. Um, well, look, I, I don't agree, I don't think, at this point, that the fix is in quite for Trump. I think the American establishment is so fractured over the t Trump question. Um, he is in the process, as you know today, of trying to build now a Republican consensus around him. And he was in Washington, because he's a shrewd he has shrewd rat-like cunning, and he knows that it was time for him to go to Washington to do some fence mending with some of the people who are f afraid of him because he is a loose cannon. And the Republican elites, as we can see with you know, uh, Mitt Romney and all the others running around desperately trying to head him off, uh, you know, there's a lot of powerful sort of elites in the country who are still not there yet with Trump. So. Uh, and Hillary Clinton, look, I mean, Hillary Clinton would deliver all the things that we're talking about for the elites. Uh, there will be continued war in the Middle East. There will be co a continued massive surveillance state. There will be continued Wall Street fraud and looting. Um, and she's not going to really do a whole lot, really, to, to uh, restrain that. She's going to talk a pretty good game to try and bring Bernie's people into the campaign and get young people to vote and all that. But, you know, so I don't think they're so frightened of her, the elites. In fact, uh, you know, many elites are, are with her and think she's their best opportunity. That, uh, so I, I wouldn't uh, say at this point Trump is a sure bet. But you know what? Here's what I'm afraid of. Trump is a wild card, and if there is some kind of wild card event, like another terror attack, something like Paris the, in, the, in the United States, then all bets are off. I mean, he's, such, he's done such a great job of whipping people's fears and hysteria up, particularly around Muslims, that um, all hell could break loose uh, if there is another major terror attack like that. And, you know, I've done so much research, and I'm sure some of, many of you have too, into the national security state, and it's not uh, out of the question to me that there's an element within the national security state that does want a Donald Trump to be elected. And it wants the police state to finally be completed that we're on the way towards. And certainly Donald Trump would consolidate that police state. Um, and, you know, then we're talking about a whole different game. I mean, I know there's really, uh, you know, I don't like to get too paranoid. I've been on the left my whole life, and the left can tend to get that way, and it's not useful. But this is probably the first time in my life when I've begun to use words like fascism. And uh, because that's what it feels like at these rallies. I have reporters there who are telling me what it's like. Uh, there's a young reporter I have now writing a, one of these hot books for me. And he says, you know, he's a big, tough guy, but he says it's truly frightening, you know. And what you have is the sense of desperation among working and unemployed people in this country. They've been so fucked over, so exploited for so long, so taken advantage of by the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, that they're desperate enough to put their hopes in a, a complete charlatan like this billionaire bully. 
you know, as if he, this guy who's lived his whole life in a billionaire bubble, can understand anything about their lives. I mean, gives a damn about them. I mean, I've heard stories from other reporters about his personal life and what a pig he is. He's a pig to the, his servants, and they are servants to him, who work for him, uh, the, you know, the gardeners and so on. He's the women who service him. Um, you know, the guy is a pig, and he would be a pig to the American people, too. Right here. Uh, good question. The gentleman asks about the relationship between the head of the FBI, uh, famous... Uh, power uh, figure in Washington for many years, J. Edgar Hoover, and Alan Dulles at the CIA. Big rivalry uh, between those two. Um, and I think Hoover knew who was higher on the chain of command. So you have the CIA in ter class terms, Ivy League bred, white shoe lawyers, uh, the American elite. You have the FBI, sort of working class guys, former cops, some of them, Catholic, uh, educated. Um, and not as slick, and, and as ruthless, I think, not as slick or ruthless as the CIA types. And when the two agencies would come into conflict, really when push comes to shove, in the cases I saw, the major cases, Hoover would back down. And in fact, in one case, I, I talked to a guy, who, a former FBI guy, who said Hoover told him, basically, um, I, you know, when it comes to me versus the CIA, I have to back away. Uh, so I think they did cooperate around the Warren report because they both, there were mutual interests there. In the case of the CIA, I think they were the perpetrators of the crime, or at least this core group within the CIA. And the FBI basically was uh, embarrassed. Uh, they blew it. They let, uh, they were played by the CIA. And uh, so Hoover was very, of course, uh, obsessive about guarding the uh, reputation of the FBI, so he went along with the cover-up so his own agency wouldn't be tarnished by the investigation. Yes. So did you all hear that? Uh, he, the gentleman sees some parallels between 9-11 and uh, the Kennedy assassination, as do other, um, I think, scholars of the deep state, like Peter Dale Scott, the retired Berkeley professor. Um, uh, yeah, and one of the, I think I, I would agree. Look, I haven't done uh, my own deep research into 9-11 as I have done into Dallas, but uh, just sort of in a surface way, I, I agree with your observation. One of the key parallels there is somehow security melted away that day. Um, and, and the security uh, before the event, too, of course. I mean, the president was being told, you know, at his ranch in Texas and, and other times, that there was an imminent threat. And it, the country didn't take uh, precautionary measures. The other thing that is uh, a parallel that's similar about both of these deeply traumatic events that changed American history in profound ways is that one of the uh, almost immediate consequences was this further militarization of American life. Um, and in the case, of course, LBJ taking over uh, the, the White House from Kennedy, you had with Kennedy a young president who was determined to reduce Cold War tensions, was freaked out about the possibility of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, and was doing everything he could through back channels to, uh, you know, to establish some kind of communication and rapprochement with, uh, you know, Khrushchev in, in Moscow and with Fidel Castro. Uh, in the last year of his administration in, in Cuba. Um, and of course, when LBJ come and was going, determined to withdraw from Vietnam. I interviewed Robert McNamara, Kennedy's Secretary of Defense. I interviewed other key people who worked with him, and they all told me that Kennedy fully intended to withdraw from Vietnam completely after he safely beat Barry Goldwater in the 1964 election. He knew if he did it before then that Goldwater would use it as a club against him during the campaign. And so, you know, it, in, in contrast to that, of course, we know what Lyndon Johnson did as soon as he became president. He led us into the biggest military debacle of our history. Uh, Mickey, do we have time for a couple more? Okay. All right. <laughs> you were hovering there. I, I felt, I felt uh, surveilled. Uh, back over here. And then we can so, um, the... Uh, Questioner uh, takes note that a lot of the people doing sort of the deeper investigative work on secret government and that kind of thing in America are getting older and may drop 
dead at some point. <laughs> I don't know if there's something, I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, give myself a few more years, but no, I, I hear you. I mean, you know, Peter Dale Scott, who I revere, who's kind of my mentor, he's in his 80s now. You know, Chomsky is not getting any younger, and uh, Cornell West, and some of my, a lot of my heroes. I just uh, spent all day with Chris Hedges uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, because one of the uh, books we're going to be doing under my imprint, Hot Books, is a, a series called Unspeakable, which will be in-depth conversations with people who get marginalized by the media and don't get the attention they deserve. And I think of Chris Hedges as one of those. Chris, fortunately, is in great shape, and he's younger than I am. He's about 10 years younger. Um, but that's one of the reasons I actually started Hot Books, to begin to identify some of these up-and-coming writers like Alexander Zaitchik, who is this writer who's done some really good work on the CIA and is now, as I uh, mentioned earlier, working on this book about the Trump movement. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's the job of the older editors and journalists like me, before we do kick the bucket, to identify some of these younger people and help them if we can. Um, the last question was, see, yeah, I'm old, I forgot. Living in different world, different sets of... Different, yes. Facts. So we talk past each other. Yeah, well, look, I mean, when you've had a media that's consistently dumbed people down, as I was talking about during my speech, uh, you know, not just Fox News. I mean, I look at some of the people I helped train, speaking of younger people, at Salon. And I was very proud of a number of these people, Jake Tapper, uh, you know, and others, who was my sort of young, up-and-coming political correspondent Salon when I was running Salon, and now, of course, is a CNN anchor. You know, I think, yeah, is that really the best for Jake, you know, that he's now CNN anchor and he's asking, you know, a lot of, cir uh, you know, political circus questions, horse race questions about the, uh, these guys. Sometimes you see the old flair that Jake has and he's a little tougher on people, which is good. But, you know, um, by and large, the American media exists solely for ratings. Les Moonves, the head of CBS, said, eh, you know, Trump may be terrible for the country, but he's not bad for our ratings. I mean, it's that sort of cynicism that's been driving the media for so long now. And the results we're seeing now is an uneducated American public. You know, in some ways, less educated, strangely, as I said, in this digital age when we supposedly are exposed to many, so many news sources than they were in the old days when Walter Cronkite and a couple other guys told us that's the way it was, you know, uh, at the end of each newscast. I mean, we had three networks telling us that's the way it was, and that was it. Um, but in some ways, the level of discourse, the political debates that, you know, many people have commented on this when you look at the old TV debates between Nixon and Kennedy and, and other presidential campaigns, you go, whoa, they're using big words, you know? Yeah. Uh, not like, I have a bigger dick than you, you know? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I just could not believe the GOP debates. I mean, you know, so, yeah. So I think that's what's going on now is that none of us are living in fact-based reality, you're, really, unless you're really diligent about seeking out news sources and you make that your job. Yeah. And that takes time, you know, and so, and it takes the will. While it's easier, mostly, to just sort of look at the two-headed babies and what Trump said today, you know? <laughs> yes, Mickey? Trump kind of jumped the shark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly, the that's the level. Rhetoric is right around that age level. So and, yeah, and, and you know, obviously his Republican opponents didn't know what the hell to do. Then they, they, they floundered around, they, were, they looked gobsmacked at first, and then, then Rubio, of course, tried to get down the gutter with him, and that was even more embarrassing, and, and then he flamed out. I think he might have a tougher time with Hillary, and I've, I'm not a, you know, obviously, I'm not a supporter of Hillary, but I think, number one, when he does it to a woman, it doesn't come off quite as uh, entertaining. It comes off as kind of... Uh, well, sexist and also just crude and, you know, tasteless. Thank you. <laughs> You're my thesaurus. <laughs> yes, back here. Well, that was the theme of my whole talk. So the gentleman asked about the, you know, after Clinton was almost impeached over a consensual sex act, you know, uh, why wasn't uh, W, George W. Bush, uh, even the hint of uh, an impeachment process as a result of the outrageous lies that got us into this war that we're still paying for in many ways. Um, you know, bingo, you put your finger right on it. And of course, that's my whole speech tonight was about accountability or the lack of it. 
how there is no justice at the top, so there can be no justice anywhere in our society. And uh, you know, when, when this happens repeatedly, I mean, there were some hearings about Vietnam. There were some hearings about the CIA and, and their uh, excesses after Watergate, the church committee. I mean, we had sort of the inkling or the beginnings of that kind of uh, you know, system of accountability in the 70s. But there was a massive sort of uh, backlash against Vietnam. There was a huge anti-war movement. Uh, people were appalled by Watergate. And so there was popular will. And frankly, there were people in, on Capitol Hill, like Senator Frank Church, who had the guts to lead that, you know, facing massive and scary resistance from the CIA. <laughs> CIA wanted to kill him, uh, literally. So, uh, and he died rather young. And I'm still not quite sure how that happened, you know? I think he was in his 50s when he died. So uh, it takes enormous courage for the political system to hold its own crime, you know, hold its own people accountable for those crimes. Um, in the, you know, look, and with the war, in Iraq, you had also this major complicity of the American media. I mean, even the great vaunted New York Times that's supposedly our great public watchdog and does do a lot of terrific journalism. I mean, they jumped on that bandwagon and rode it all the way. Judith Miller and others, and it wasn't just her, but she was the one who helped invent the whole story about the you know, yellow Niger and uh, yellow cake in Niger and uh, the weapons of mass destruction. And still looking for him. Still looking for him. She was disciplined, but her editors were not. They continued on their careers. Uh, so again, there's no accountability in the media world either. When they, and it's not just a mistake. That's a, such a colossal error that costs so much human life. Those people all should not ever be in front of a TV camera again or have a high-level job. And yet all of them continue. William Crystal, who helped get us into this war, one of the neo, chief neocon you know, propagandists, he's, he's being quoted every day by the New York Times and this and that about Trump now. He was on Bill Maher the other night. You know, again, I mean, there's certain people who are so disgraced because of what they did in their profession, whether they were in intelligence or the, in the White House or whether in the media, that got us into this horrible moral you know, debacle that they should never again be allowed to practice their profession. That's my thing. But David, yet they do. David Brooks. Yes. David Brooks as well. Yeah, David Brooks, many New York Times people, and Washington Post. The Washington Post was also disgraceful in you know, cheerleading for the war, the run up to the war. And never these, there's never any public reckoning afterwards saying, you know, there was a little like, oh, whoops, we were wrong about the WMD, and that was it. It was buried inside on page 11 in the New York Times. Yes. Comment well, and, and it's, they twist it so you're uh, impugning the bravery and the integrity of our, our troops. Right. You exactly. saw this with Vietnam. So, you know, anti-war people, oh, you're spitting on the soldiers. Right. I guess that happened. I, wor I was in the anti-war movement during Vietnam. I worked with a lot of veterans. We loved it when the veterans came and worked with us. We welcomed them. You know, so um, I didn't see that. And I think it's the same today. The, uh, the people who really honor the troops are the peace movement. And the people who fight for veterans' benefits, like Bernie Sanders, and not these Tea Party creeps who talk about honoring our troops and never vote for any of uh, the health and welfare votes that come up for troops in, in, in Congress. So, OK, Bob, he asked about Bobby Kennedy and what I think basically happened there. And was there any parallel between the plot of the Manchurian candidate, where someone is programmed, uh, you know, hypnotized to, to kill, and what happened with Bobby. Yes and yes. So here's what I think happened, and I've done uh, a fair amount of research into Bobby Kennedy's murder, and unfortunately it hasn't attracted nearly the kind of uh, firepower of investigation that the other assassinations have, like his brother. But here's what, ha here's what happened, and I, I got this from interviewing people who I think uh, in one case, it has a important new information to shed on this. I think that um, as soon as Bobby announced for president, his life was in danger. Mm -hmm. His family knew this. Jackie uh, and his brother Teddy begged him not to run. They knew, the whole family knew, that JFK had been killed as a result, of, if you read my earlier book, Brothers, yeah. had been killed by a conspiracy. They knew that the people who had killed JFK were still out there. So imagine the bravery of this guy to, he had what, 10 or 11 kids at the time? 
Um, he, uh, his, his family's begging him not to run, but the whole country's in a mess. Uh, you know, he knows that. He goes for, he, he went through a long night of the soul trying to figure out whether he should run or not. He was tortured by the decision. And he went at one point to, um, uh, you know, one of the old sort of uh, journalists in Washington and asked him whose name I'm forgetting now. Uh, and he said, well, if you can live with yourself knowing that Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon will be the next president, then you don't have to run. And of course, he couldn't live with himself knowing that that was going to be the case. And, was, and of course, as soon as he announced, Lyndon Johnson soon after, you know, uh, announced his resignation. So it had an immediate impact. Um, so Bobby throws himself into these campaign rallies. And there's no Secret Service protection. He has one ex-FBI guy named Bill Barry. He has Rafer Johnson, the former Olympic athlete. He has Rosie Greer, former LA Ram. A couple guys, you know, protecting him in huge crowds. They claw at him, they scratch him. Um, he was being stalked, I think, as JFK was. JFK could have been killed in Chicago, we now know. There was a parallel plot there not long before Dallas. He was being stalked in Florida. The CIA was waiting for its moment. So I think that was what they were doing with Bobby too. They were waiting to see if he'd actually make it. And the California primary was the turning point because as soon as he won California, his way was pretty well paved to Chicago. And as he said at the Ambassador Hotel that night, now it's on to Chicago and we'll win there. And he probably would have. Dick Daly, the mayor of Chicago, had called him that night, congratulated him, said, you know, I'm on your team with Dick Daly, <laughs> sort of talk about crooks, right? you know, <laughs> controlling things. He, he looked in pretty good shape. Um, so here's what happened. He comes off the stage. He goes into the pantry. He's being led to a press room to meet with the press. It's a very narrow, dark space. Um, and uh, shots begin to ring out. Uh, one of the shooters, obviously, is this young guy, Sirhan Sirhan, but he's in a complete daze. Strangely, John Frankenheimer, the director who made the Manchurian Canada, I interviewed, and he said he saw Sirhan, and he had this weird flash that this is Manchurian Canada, which is really eerie. I mean, it's like talking about life imitating art or art. Um, John Frankenheimer, he was staying, Bobby, at John Frankenheimer's house in Malibu while he was in L.A. Uh, his wife said, he, I interviewed John's wife later, she said we went back to the home that night after Bobby was shot and Bobby's wet trunks were still in his room and it's like, you know, it's like, I always remember that image. Anyway, so gunfire erupts. Sirhan Sirhan is, by all witnesses' accounts, about four to five feet in front of Bobby Kennedy. He's firing wildly and as soon as he begins to shoot, his, hand, his arm is grabbed by a number of people, including George Plim Plimpton, the famous writer, and uh, others, and they wrestle him to, you know, down. They slam his arm down. Uh, none of them said, later testified, that there's any way he could have fired the fatal shot. He probably did shoot Paul Schrade, who's a great guy, who was the United Auto Workers activist who was working on Bobby's campaign. Paul got hit in the head that night and he survived miraculously. But the fatal shot that kills Bobby Kennedy is fired at point blank range because there's gunpowder burns on the back of the skull from uh, behind his left ear, I believe, his left ear. So what I think Sir Han's role was, was a decoy. He was programmed to basically get all the attention, focus all the attention, begin firing, while a professional killer behind Bobby uh, delivered the fatal shot. Um, there was a security guard, there's been a lot of attention devoted to him, as you know, Thane Eugene Caesar, who actually did pull his gun. Um, and here's the interesting part, um, Thane Caesar, worked for a security firm, a private security firm. Uh, I later found out that uh, a guy named Robert Mayhew, who was the private security guy who the CIA went to to do a lot of its domestic dirty work because under law, the CIA can't operate on US soil. So what they would do, and I'm sure they still do this, they work with local police departments that often have a kind of uh, spy unit within the Metropolitan Police Force in New York or Los Angeles. They also work with private security contractors and Bob Mayhew was one of those guys. He ran one of the biggest firms. And he later, um, and, and he was hired by the CIA to recruit the mafia to kill Castro. So we know he was a killer. And he know, we know that he was doing uh, assassination, you know, wet work as they say for the CIA. Later, he gets himself appointed head of Howard Hughes operation in Las Vegas. 
So again, he's working closely with a lot of organized crime people, and now he's situated in Las Vegas. I was told by somebody who worked in that organization at a high level that, um, that he saw Thane Caesar meeting with uh, Mayhew, and Mayhew's top security guy, um, shortly before Bobby was killed. It, it makes sense to me that the hit would, be, would have been delivered that night by these private security guys who were hired that night just for that occasion from a firm that was run by Mayhew. He, I mean, how convenient is this? The CIA you know, assassination contractor runs security firms with guys with guns. And he supplies it to the hotel that night. And one of them leading Bobby into you know, the pantry I think quite easily, if it wasn't Caesar, it might have been another, uh, you know. Thane Caesar's gun was never tested by the police. Um, you know, there was lots of weird forensic stuff. Uh, Sirhan's gun only held eight bullets, but there was clear physical evidence that there were more than eight shots uh, fired that night, and audio evidence as well. The coroner of Los Angeles County, very famous guy, Tom Noguchi, said in his memoir, Sir Han is not the assassin. Based on the forensic evidence, there was no way he could have fired the fatal shot. So that is not a case that's closed. And every time, of course, that Sir Han comes up for, uh, to be released, there's very powerful forces that don't allow that because they want that, him to go to his grave as the Lee Harvey Oswald as the John Wilkes Booth that we all think killed Bobby Kennedy. He didn't kill Bobby Kennedy. He was the fall guy like Lee Harvey Oswald. He was in a deeply hypnotic state when he was arrested and taken in to jail. The prosecutors and the homicide cops who interviewed him said he was totally out of it. He didn't know what he'd done. He was like on the moon. So that's the way they worked. And if you read my book about MKUltra, this enormous mind control program, you know, billion dollar program that they ran under Alan Dulles, you see that they were capable of doing just such a thing. I mean, Alan Dulles even experimented on his own son, who came back from the Korean War brain damaged. I mean, I mean, these people are just ruthless. Anyway, one more. Okay, one here. Well, this, you know, this kind of um, unfortunately psychological deterioration happens often when soldiers are forced to do jobs that they shouldn't be forced to do. I mean, war itself, we all know, is just uh, you know incredibly brutalizing for everyone involved. But I think particularly when you're sent into a country to occupy a country, and you should never have been given that assignment, and these people are fighting desperately to defend their homeland, then uh, atrocities always happen. It's happened throughout America's imperial history. Smedley Darlington Butler, who was a great Marine hero who was forced to fight uh, in all these Banana Republic wars, you know, in the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, and he was in China and Philippines and Central America. You know, he later said, uh, you know, and there was lots of atrocities committed there too in these wars. In Haiti, terrible atrocities in Haiti when we occupied Haiti. When we are sent to occupy other countries, uh, there's going to be strong resistance from most self-respecting people. And then, of course, there's, uh, you know, as soon as soldiers start dying and, and buddies see their soldiers being killed, they go nuts often. They react, you know, overreact. And this is just, I think, the wages of imperial war. And you know, as long as we keep sending our young men and women into these kind of wars, these impossible wars, we can expect these things to keep happening. Whether it's blowing up the hospital in Kunduz in um, Afghanistan, um, or these terrible things that you mentioned in Vietnam. Models, yeah, the helicopter. Every day. Yeah, no, I hear you. OK, what, last question here, yeah. Who died in the plane crash? Yeah. yeah. Is there anything to that, or is there a conspiracy to that? Or? You know, I haven't done the research. I'm afraid on that. Um, you know, obviously, whenever Kennedy dies, now we get paranoid. So, <laughs> who knows? Um, I, I've heard some people, you know, who have some valid uh, information, uh, seemingly valid information, have shared that with me. But I just don't know enough myself. I do. Paul Wellstone. Yeah. All right, just, just the woman, uh, the woman here. Oh, OK. Can I ask, um, so all of these yeah, so she's asking, is there, are there new tools or new uh, types of information that we can access now that we may not 
have been able to a while ago when it comes to things like the Kennedy assassination. You know, that's everyone's hope that there will be some sort of tech solution to it. I mean, and there have been some interesting things, like they found that this cop's motorcycle uh, recorder was left on in Dallas and Dealey Plaza, and so, the, you know, they recorded the shots. Uh, there was a dicta belt that had the, the shots recorded. Uh, like I said earlier, Bobby Kennedy, there was a radio reporter who had a tape recorder in the pantry in a hotel the night he was killed. And so they recorded, boom, 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 the number of shots, and they were, sounded like there were more than eight. Um, so there, you know, there could be, although it's pretty late for some of this stuff to come out at this point. Now, what could come out about JFK that very, is very important are documents that the CIA is still withholding in violation of the law. Because of Oliver Stone's film in 1991, JFK, there was such a big public uproar, Congress was forced to pass something called the JFK Records Collection Act. And every government agency under that law was required to release every document it had that was related in any way to the Kennedy presidency and assassination. And I have used thousands of do those documents as of, have many other writers uh, to paint, I think, a more accurate portrait of the Kennedy presidency as a government at war with itself. That was an important revelation. So that came out of those documents, and it was quite clear from looking at those documents, Kennedy was at war with the CIA, he was at war with the Pentagon, as he tried to lead America out of the Cold War. Uh, there was a massive blowback against him because of that. Uh, and when my new book goes further into that, because I found the diaries uh, kept by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. when he worked for Kennedy at the White House, the famous historian, some of which had been published, but a lot of uh, the diary entries had not been published. And again, inside view of the incredible tension that's building within the Kennedy presidency that explodes in Dallas. Schlesinger, before he died, told me we, meaning the White House, didn't control the CIA and we didn't control the Pentagon, which is a pretty heavy thing uh, to say in a democracy. But in any case, there's over 1,100 documents, important documents, apparently, that the CIA, in violation of that law, are still <laughs> holding on to. They keep saying, oh, well, in a few more years, maybe we'll release them. Jeff Morley, Jefferson Morley, a really great reporter who has a, a great website, called jfkfacts.org. It sort of covers the Kennedy assassination as if it's an ongoing news story, which it kind of is. He has filed suit against the CIA under the Freedom of Information Act to get access to those documents. He's still yeah, fighting it. years ago, he was calling Oliver Stone a kook and stuff, and then he got this. this Who, Jeff Morley? on the door, Jefferson Morley. I know, Jeff gets some, like. Uh, this info guy. I know some people don't like Jeff because they think he plays it too down the middle. Uh, you know, and he, look, I'm frustrated with Jeff too. I think he should go further. I think he knows, uh, he knows enough to go further. But I think he plays a game because he lives in Washington that he wants to keep uh, his, you know, lines of communication open to everyone. That's not my game, but I understand where Jeff's coming from. I like him, he's a friend, and I think he has done a lot of good work. And one of the things we owe him credit for is this lawsuit. He's really trying to, you know, bust those documents out. So I do think those documents include certain things like Will, uh, Bill Harvey's travel records. I sued the CIA to get access to those travel records. I wanted to prove what his deputy in Rome had told his children, that he flew to Dallas in early November 63. Uh, That's a heavy thing to know that the top assassin for the CIA is somehow flying to Dallas then, right? And we want to know, is that true? And why, what was he doing there? The CIA refused to release those documents to me. So the only way they're ever going to release those documents, and it's amazing to me that they haven't destroyed them, but I guess at this point there's a paper trail, so you know they can't destroy certain documents, but um, is if there's, again, an uproar like after JFK, and there's so much public pressure, the CIA has to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank David Talbot, everybody. I um, very quickly uh, concluding remarks, and I want Liz to come up here from the sociology club and say a couple of words. But I was reminded of a, a, a really um, a great quote 
that I've used several times over the years and was thinking about it repeatedly uh, when David Talbot was speaking. It's a, a quote from uh, an Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore. Some of you may remember it from the 1920s. It's truth comes as a conqueror only to those who have lost the art of receiving it as a friend. And a lot of this kind of information, people greet it with skepticism and they don't accept what it is because they'd have to change their whole view of the world and their whole paradigm. Um, but it's really important to try to face the truth and keep asking questions. So we certainly keep doing that at Project Censored and I'd be remiss in some of my MC duties if I didn't remind you all that this is our 40th anniversary year at Project Censored. And we were founded right here by Carl Jensen at Sonoma State University in 1976. Carl passed away last spring. Um, Peter Phillips, who's in the back there, uh, ran the project until about five odd years ago uh, when I took over with uh, Andy Lee Roth. And of course, Peter still does a lot of great work with us. Um, and I just wanted to tell you all that this fall, October, I think it's 21, 22, somewhere around there, we're having our 40th anniversary Media Freedom Summit. We want to make sure that you're all invited. Uh, pay attention to the projectcensored.org website and you can find out a lot more information about that. The, the summit will be here at Sonoma State University. So pay attention and we hope to see you all for the celebration this fall.